Born in Flint, Michigan, Paul Curtis spent his first 13 years after high school hanging doors at Flint's famous uh, automotive plant at Fisher Body. As an award-winning author of children's books, Mr. Curtis' writings are greatly influenced by the lives and experiences of some of his family members, such as his two grandfathers, one of which was a 1930s band leader, and the other who was a pitcher in the Negro Baseball League. Listen as Alex Steubenborg reads an excerpt from Madman of Piney Woods. Good afternoon. Um, this is taken from chapter 15 of Madman of Piney Woods, uh, entitled 26 Letters. Everyone in Buxton thought and hoped this would be Spencer's year to win the public speaking contest, and I had been sort of jealous. Even though we were best friends, it seemed like he was doing much better than me. Like he was getting noticed and appreciated, and I wasn't. I know it's silly, but that's what I couldn't help feeling. But now that was going to change. Now we'd be moving up together. It wouldn't be long before he was Canada's greatest lawyer, and I was Canada's greatest newspaperman. And the strange thing was we were both doing it because we loved what words could do. We both wanted to be like those people who can magically make words do all sorts of things. In the right hands, words can move more bricks than the strongest team of mules. And what I don't, what I don't get is that while most of us can talk and a whole bunch of us can write, there are only the teeny weeniest number of people who know how to make words do magic. I mean, words are made up of letters, nothing more. And there are only 26 of them. And they're there for all of us to use. There's no, no one saying, no, you can't use these letters. They're safe for only that certain group. It's the same 26 letters taught to most of us. But only few can make those letters fall into words and do tricks and lift bricks and move mountains. There's no denying that some people can make words do miracles. Nikki Grimes does not consider herself a bona fide storyteller, but as she told an audience at the Library of Congress, she's just happy to be known as a poet. Born and raised in New York City, Nikki began composing verse at the age of six and has been writing ever since. Follow along with Nikki's words is read by Sandy Belfort, Linda Powers, Thomas Kennedy, Tiffany Adams, Hobie Savage, and Kira Virgil. Hello, I'm Linda Powers, and I'm privileged to read uh, Words with Wings. Some words sit still on the page, holding a story steady. Those words never get me into trouble. But other words have wings that wake my daydreams. They fly in silent as sunrise, tickle my imagination, and carry my thoughts away. I can't help but buckle up for the ride. Waterfall. Say waterfall in the dreary winter rain outside my classroom window turns to liquid thunder, pounding into a clear pool miles below, and I can't wait to dive in. Say butterfly, and I'm swimming in sunshine, sprawled in the grass, blowing on a blade to make a whistle, and eyeing the sky for small fluttering things wearing rainbow wings. Say rainbow, <laughs> squeeze my eyes tight, dig my fingers into the safety bars as we climb six stories, then speed down again faster than my screams can carry. And as soon as we reach the end of the ride, I'm the first to yell, do it again, do it again. <laughs> Say dragon, and I raise my shield, fed off the fire of his mighty breath. Then, when he's not looking, I scramble onto his back, grab a handful of scales, and ride across the sky, till the sun dives into the sea. When class lets out, I hurry home, hungry for dinner, and hoping to find more words with wings to dream and write about tomorrow.
Langston Hughes was one of America's most recognized poets, a social activist, novelist, thought illustrator, doll maker and crafter. Her passion for children's books began when she, was, when she read Snowy Day, which was the first time where black children were represented in a picture book and had characters that looked like hers and in her neighborhood. It was a turning point in her life. Fun and whimsical has a beautiful melody. Her style is influenced by retro art and fashion from the 50s and 60s. Welcome to Ms. Bocaro's Crystal River primary students as they present Let Freedom Ring. Can we have a microphone yes. there just pass it down? The book Let Freedom Sing adapts the music from the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s. We sing about the hardships black Americans faced day in and day out. They sing about overcoming all odds and always letting the best in themselves shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. On benches just for color, black folks obeyed the rules. December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks refused to move. She let her light shine. December 4, 1955, preaching from his pulpit, Dr. King had a dream. When he spoke in Alabama, he let his light shine. <clears throat> Boycotts in Montgomery, Dr. King inspired it all. Walkers along the bus routes, he let his light shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. September 23, 1957. The Little Rock Nine, Schools for Black and Little Rock, Separate but Not Equal. Nine high school kids let their life shine. February 1st, 1960, the Greenboro Force. Students at lunch counters hope to be served as the Greenboro Force at waiting. They let their light shine. December 14, 1960, at a school in New Orleans, Shattered fill the air, Ruby Ridges walked alone, she let her light shine. August 23, 1963, at the March on Washington, thousands walked for miles. Dr. King had a dream, he let his light shine. July 2, 1964, August 6, 1965, President Lyndon Johnson helped to change the law. Civil rights were around. He let his light shine. July, January 20th, 2009. Speaking to all Americans, Barack Obama had a dream. As President of the United States, he let his light shine. them and offer some comments on all the young people who are here today. Unfortunately, she must have found out I was going to do that, so she called in sick. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, she truly wanted to be here, and friends and family basically tied her down and said, you can't go. So I would just like to extend on behalf of our committee thanks to her and the entire school board members who have made our district one of the top districts in the for the last seven or eight years, I believe, and some of the schools actually have been ranked top in the nation. So uh, we should give the school board an applause while, while they're here. <laughs>
That grace my head. Confident is she that displays such beauty, braided, cornrowed, twisted, or plaits, embraced instead of iron flat. Curiosity of the masses has captured their attention, may be frowned upon when mentioned. However, it's wonderful, invigorating, free, natural, my identity. Accessorized, fashionable, adored, born to way you were born, take it in, accept it. It's true, that style looks amazing on you. As you walk down the street, head held high, pride shown to every passerby. Many people stop and stare to get a glimpse of my nappy hair. Although often misunderstood, don't worry, because I'm feeling good. Locked, fro, or bus cut to my nap, nothing, none can compare to my fantastically owned nappy hair. Thank you. like to sing along with us in the chorus of this song, if you know it, we would love to have you join us.
James McBride is a native New Yorker and a graduate of New York City Public Schools. He studied composition at the Oberlin Conservatory in Ohio and received his master's degree in journalism from Columbia University. Two special notes about his writings. His mother was a Jewish immigrant from Poland and influenced his writing. And by the way, if you're ever gloomy or bored, go to his website. Trust me, you will laugh and you'll have fun. I'm giving you an assignment there. Ginger Bryant lights up the room with the good Lord bird. from a novel by James McBride. Hold a minute, Captain. Hear a voice come from the back of the room. Every head turned to see a woman. She was the only woman in the room, besides yours truly, who don't count. She was short, slender. She was a short, slender number. She wore her hair under a wrap and a simple maid's dress and apron. Her feet was covered by a pair of man's boots. She dressed like a slave, except for a colorful shawl, beaten and worn, which she carried across her arm. She had a quiet manner about her. She weren't a talker, you could see that, but her eyes were dark and boiling. She moved toward the front of the room like the wind, silent, smooth, taut as a rope. And then fellers parted and slid their benches out of the way to let her pass. There was something fearful about that woman, silent, terrible, and strong. And I made up my mind to keep away from her right off. I had good practice being a girl by then. But colored women could sniff out my true nature better than most. And something told me that a powerful looking woman like that could not be fooled with, nor did she fool easily. She slipped to the front of the room with her hands folded across her chest and faced the men. If you passed by the window of the old lodge, and peeked inside, you'd have thunk a cleaning woman was addressing a room full of professors, explaining to them why she hadn't cleaned the privy or some such thing. For the men were dressed in suits and hats and bow ties, whereas she was dressed as a simple slave. My name is Harriet Tubman, she said. And I know this man, she nodded to the captain. John Brown don't have to explain nothing to this plain woman. If he says he has a good plan, he's got a good plan. Bishop T.D. Jakes is a charismatic leader, visionary, provocative thinker who serves as a senior pastor of Potter's House, a global humanitarian organization and a 30,000 member church located in Dallas. He was once named America's best preacher by Time Magazine. Uh, Bishop Jakes, through his nexus of charitable works, is known for extending a hand of help to the needy, sharing a heart of compassion to the hurting, and a message of inspiration to the disenfranchised. Doug Dodd, Patrick Thomas, and the Citrus Drama students present Reposition yourself, living life without limits. Good afternoon. Here, T.D. Jakes, a great preacher, talks about homemade quilts with her various pieces held together by straight threads and knots and compares that to families. Now, I know the mass-produced quilt has no wild, loose threads. It has no knots tied in the back and it looks first rate from every angle, but the only reason it looks like that is that it is not a real quilt. Remaining a part of your family community and giving back to it may require dealing with some wild threads and broken pieces. 
the crucial flaw of the factory produced quilt is that it doesn't show us how to keep the pieces together in this imperfect world we live in. We need to see the threads underneath to know that it's possible to have known a rough past and still have the prospect of a beautiful future. Have extraordinary opportunities before you. Possibilities secured by the blood, sweat, <coughs> tears, and dollars of your parents, grandparents, and their parents. Don't separate yourself from your heritage. Be it black, white, Hispanic, Asian, or some other rich and ethnic. Use the quilts that your ancestors patched together from what they had been given. Warm yourself, comfort yourself, and sustain yourself by remembering what came before you. Add your unique design to this quilt so that when you pass it on to others, will benefit from what you have learned and how you have lived. <coughs> Tell your story, show your colors, add your slant to it. Stitch your wisdom in with your grandmother and pass it on. Your life is part of an intergenerational masterpiece. A quilt of lives linked by more than blood. A tapestry woven from sacrifice, resilience, and triumph. When your children's children receive it, they need to see that we must not simply duplicate what our past ancestors did, but make our own mark. We must not simply wrap ourselves up in a cocoon of comfort and benefit from the warmth of past generations' labor. We are called to add new elements to the fabric given to us so that the next generation will know that they too have a story to add. A song to sing. A gift to give. Contributing to the community is like adding to the quilt. You leave a memorial behind to let the world know that you were here. <laughs>